Hi everyone and welcome to another episode of Deloitte Let's Talk. Today we'll be discussing the mandatory disclosure rules, also known as DAC6, and our guest speakers are Nadia Onishuk, who's a senior manager in the Deloitte Tax and Legal team, and also we have Ian Zara, who's a supervisor within the same team. So, let's get started. My first question is to you, um, Nadia. Can you tell us a bit more about the object and scope of the directive and, and what it sets out to, to achieve? Thank you, Rachel. Uh, the directive in, in general is intending to uh, introduce a new tax transparency set of tax transparency rules and the idea is to uh, impose a new set of reporting obligations on so-called tax intermediaries. And uh, the reason for that is for the member states to be able to collect the information which is uh, needed with respect to identifying potentially aggressive tax planning practices and uh, I think that the part of potentially aggressive is very important so the fact that an arrangement is reportable does not necessarily mean that it is aggressive in its nature there is just a possibility that it may be aggressive when we're looking at um, the uh, scope of the directive from a personal perspective and uh, we, we identify the persons who are obliged uh, under the directive. Uh, the directive looks at the intermediaries which uh, are defined as a very broad notion. So these are persons who are um, involved in designing and marketing of reportable cross-border arrangements or in any uh, form assisting in implementation of uh, reportable cross-border arrangements. So if uh, we look at the types of entities or professions or activities that may potentially get a, uh, let's say, a, 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 may be caught by the notion of intermediary, it's very broad. So it can be financial intermediaries, it can be banks, um, it can be corporate service providers, it can be uh, trustees, it can be tax advisors and any other person who uh, by virtue of uh, provision of uh, certain professional services assists in either implementation of a reportable cross-border arrangement or in let's say designing and creating and marketing that uh, reportable cross-border arrangement. It's interesting to say that there, the, the obligations in terms of the directive, they are twofold. So in the first instance, the uh, reporting is, uh, the obligation to report is on intermediary, but in certain instances, there may be situations where taxpayers themselves, relevant taxpayers are obliged to report uh, the uh, reportable cross-border arrangement and those are the situations where either there is no intermediary involved or where uh, the, the intermediary is covered by uh, professional secrecy. Um, in principle, for a, a professional or for an, an entity to become an intermediary and have a reporting obligation, you also have to have a nexus with the European Union in general. So, and that can happen either by way of being established in the European Union or resident in the European Union or registered within the professional association anywhere in the European Union. And then the reporting obligation specifically in Malta would arise when this link is with Malta. Otherwise, you as an intermediary may be potentially also caught by other member states' regulations. So the, the directive uh, is implemented in each member state and of course when assessing your compliance obligations uh, from uh, this point of view, one needs to look at uh, uh, the EU in general and not only in Malta because transposition can be very different. And uh, another important uh, point uh, of definition in this case for the purposes of defining the scope of the directive is uh, that uh, the reporting obligation arises only with respect to certain um, arrangements, right? And uh, the directive calls uh, those arrangements reportable cross-border arrangements. Um, the term arrangement itself is very broad, so one may look at either transaction itself or the whole restructuring step plan. It's very broad and that broad definition has been created on purpose but, uh, within the directive. And of course there has to be a cross-border element, so there should be involvement of at least one member state and um, of course there should be one, more than one state involved. 
and uh, the most important part is that such a cross-border arrangement has to have one of the features that are that are defined in the directive and uh, those are called hallmarks um, they're listed in the annex to the directive and also in the annex of uh, domestic uh, legislation that transposes the directive um, and those hallmarks uh, basically represents the features that the European uh, Union considers to be indicative of potential aggressive tax practices so it's just an indication uh, of practice uh, of potential aggressive practices and then one may need to look into the, into the arrangement itself, identify whether any of the hallmarks are present and there of course there are certain, let's say, the, the hallmarks are grouped into five uh, groups. There are some hallmarks that uh, need to meet, uh, main benefit tests, some th that do not need to meet that uh, main benefit test, but that's uh, let's say, the more detailed uh, look into the direct. I think you've made a very good point where you mentioned kind of other EU member states and how they have transposed. Um, we have seen different transposition in different member states. One example is, for example, Poland, um, where they've transposed the directive to very different, I understand. Yes, that's correct. So it is very important to um, look at the transposition of the directive overall and at your reporting obligation in general within the EU and if you as intermediary you're advising or assisting in implementation of any of uh, potentially reportable cross-border arrangements you need to see whether you have an obligation mm -hmm. under any uh, under the laws of any other EU member state and that, that's uh, uh, correctly stated Rachel that some of uh, the member states they uh, so-called they over implemented the yeah. directive and uh, in the example of Poland there is the so-called extraterritorial application of the directive. So that's one of the areas where one needs to be potentially more careful than in other scenarios. Very good. Thank you, Nadia. Ian, over to you. Um, can you talk a bit around the reporting deadlines, please? Yes, uh, as Nadia explained, um, when you have a hallmark, you have a reportable cross-border arrangement and the directive sets out the procedure uh, through which intermediaries or in some cases taxpayers have to report to the respective authorities, in our case the Maltese tax authorities. The directive um, includes a grandfathering clause which basically prescribes that um, for cross-border arrangements which were entered into before the 25th of June 2018, um, such uh, transactions are not reportable cross-border arrangements. So basically we are looking at transactions or arrangements which have occurred after this date, mm -hmm. the 25th of June 2018. Originally the, the directive included a number of timelines and deadlines which have been changed now through the legal notice which was just issued by the um, Maltese, Maltese government whereby uh, the Maltese government adopted um, the extension provided by um, the EU after an agreement reached on a new level where because of COVID the EU decided to provide an, an, optional, um, an optional deferral of six months for deadlines so as to help taxpayers and intermediaries um, to conform with the deadlines of the directive. For reportable cross-border arrangements which were entered into between the 1st of July 2020 and the end of December 2020, the 30-day filing period for intermediaries or in some cases taxpayer, taxpayers shall begin by the 1st of January 2021. Ian, following up on the, on the reporting aspect of the directive, do we have any guidance which has been issued with respect to the directive, also any information on, on how we're supposed to be communicating this information to the authorities? Yes, yeah, so thank you for your question. Currently we're seeing different member states issuing their own respective guidance um, following the transposition of the directive. Locally we do not currently have any either procedure or substantial okay. guidance in relation to tax 6. However, we expect that the Commissioner for Revenue should be um, introducing guidance with respect to both aspects of, of uh, tax 6 fairly soon. Thank you for that. Um, one last question, if I may. What are the risks involved in, in not reporting or not complying uh, with the directive? There are a number of risks. Um, one of the major risks being penalties. Yeah. Um, the directive um, left it up to member states to decide penalties in their respective jurisdictions. Malta has introduced its own penalties and some of which uh, can reach up to 30,000 euros 
um, for for taxpayers where uh, or intermediaries intermediaries where they do not comply with the provisions of the directive. So it would be advisable for taxpayers and intermediaries to make sure that they comply with the provisions of the directive. Um, these penalties can arise due to a number of um, a number of mistakes which can be made by uh, intermediaries, including, for example, not reporting by the deadlines or reporting incorrect information, not complying with requests or for information by the Commissioner for Revenue. So there are a number of provisions which provide for these uh, penalties and it would be um, important for, for taxpayers to make sure that they are complying with these provisions. Thank you, Ian. Nadia, if I may, another question to you. What are we seeing in terms of, of clients, um, queries, um, how this is going to be taken forward in the near future? Uh, thank you for your question, Rachel. Um, we definitely see an increased attention from our clients to the matter of uh, complying with the directive and the local regulations. Um, there are a number of things that uh, are let's say already being done by the clients, so they are uh, in the process of creating internal policies and procedures for, for compliance purposes and very often we are assisting them with that. We have a number uh, of queries that we receive on a weekly basis with respect to interpretation of uh, various hallmarks which are specific to a uh, fact pattern of a particular case. Um, we, of course, uh, there are a number also of trainings that uh, our clients are undertaking and that's also been facilitated by us, so either we are training the in-house teams uh, for, let's say, understanding uh, mm -hmm. the, the, the requirements of the directive and also following, uh, let's say, the creation of procedures internally, how to uh, let's say comply and ensure that the, the, the cl our clients are complying with their reporting obligations. And of course, and I think that's the most interesting part, because everybody is seeking to achieve more mm -hmm. with less. Uh, technology is an inherent part of the process. Uh, we ourselves as Deloitte, we have uh, developed a tool uh, which helps ourselves to comply with the uh, MDR or DAC6 reporting obligations and this is now being rolled out to our clients in order uh, to help them and comply with, 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 the, with the reporting obligations and uh, I think more information on this could be found by the link below and uh, we of course will be happy to answer any questions or queries with respect to how the tool may be utilized and what are the real benefits of the technology in this area. Thank you, Nadia. Um, a big thank you to both Nadia and Ian for being with us today. Um, thank you for watching and we wait to see you on another episode of Deloitte Let's Talk.